In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association Tonight on primetime, the fight over counting absentee ballots, why Georgia Republicans want the issue to head back to the courts. And when it comes to fall holidays, carving pumpkins, you're good to go, but trick-or-treating is a no-no. We are breaking down new guidance from the CDC about safe ways to celebrate. And a 94-year-old World War II veteran putting a smile on everybody's face during his daily walks, how a group of bus drivers from schools found a way to show their appreciation. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Tonight we're digging deeper after two people were killed in officer-involved shootings over the last 24 hours in our area. One, a man killed in southeast Atlanta. The other, a woman killed in Oconee County with body camera video just released this afternoon. Latasha Givens walks us through what it shows. Drop the knife. This is body camera footage just released by the Oconee County Sheriff's Department, capturing the moments before a deputy shot and killed a woman on Monday. Drop the knife. In the video, the deputy is heard telling the woman to drop the knife while she continues to yell various words. I'm trying to help you. Moments later, she's seen running towards the deputy, and that's when he opened fire. Investigators say deputies were responding to a domestic violence call at a home on Creekview Court after Julia Ann Moss stabbed a dog and hit a man in the head with a pipe. Deputies say Moss appears to be in a manic state, armed with a knife and holding a blowtorch. Deputies say they tried to talk with her for about 17 minutes. The body camera footage appears to show the woman throwing items across the room while a deputy stands in the doorway. If I go low, can you go high? The sheriff's office says Deputy Swisher fired his taser and Corporal Henderson fired his gun when Moss charged at them. The body camera video released to us ends there. The sheriff's office says deputies tried to perform CPR, but Moss died at the scene. Today, the GBI ed identified another person killed in a police shooting yesterday in southeast Atlanta. Investigators say Darian Bell was arguing with his wife yesterday inside a car on Casanova Street when he pulled out a gun. The GBI says officers tried to convince Bell to drop the gun for nearly 15 minutes as he walked around with it. The agency says when he moved toward an officer, she shot him. The GBI was called in to investigate and says it will hand over its finding to the district attorney to review. 11 Alive has obtained a copy of the latest White House Coronavirus Task Force report, which praises Georgia for making progress in lowering new cases. Here is a look at Georgia's curve. That is the dotted line. It's clear that cases have been falling since early August. For only the second time since June, newly reported cases are below 1,000 today. Still, even with the gains, the task force still lists Georgia in the red zone with the 14th highest rate in the country. One of the reasons for that is that new testing numbers are declining. In the past week, an old backlog of tests was reported to the state, but new testing has dropped off significantly over the last five weeks. 
Health experts emphasize more testing is needed to help us stay on top of the progress that has been made fighting the virus. Now, the holidays are going to be here very soon with Halloween and Thanksgiving coming up in the next couple of months. The CDC now releasing its guidelines on how to celebrate these big days safely because the pandemic is going nowhere. Yeah, this is something a lot of folks have been concerned about as we look forward to these holidays. So we are breaking down some of the most popular activities based on their risk levels. First up, Halloween. Low risk activities include carving pumpkins with your family or maybe doing a virtual costume contest. The risk level starts to go up when it comes to pumpkin patches. The CDC says if you're going to do this, you need to wear a mask, use hand sanitizer and keep your distance from others. Outdoor costume parades also have a moderate risk of spreading the virus. High risk activities that should be avoided are things like traditional trick or treating, indoor haunted houses, hay rides with strangers and Halloween parties. You should also not try to substitute costume masks for a face mask. In fact, the CDC recommends staying away from costume masks altogether this year. Moving on to Thanksgiving, the CDC says some low risk activities include having a small dinner with only the people who live in your household for all of you shoppers on Black Friday. The CDC recommends, you guessed it, going online. Moderate risk activities, having dinner outdoors with friends and family who don't live in your household. Watching small outdoor sporting events in the high risk category. Large indoor gatherings, shopping in person on Thanksgiving or Black Friday, going to a crowded parade or even a race. And the Peachtree Road Race, of course, has gone virtual to keep people from gathering in Atlanta. Right now on the 11 Alive Facebook page, a lot of viewers weighing in on how they will spend Halloween and Thanksgiving. Let us know what your plans are and if anything has changed because of COVID. Tonight, the Republican National Committee and the Georgia Republican Party are urging a federal judge to overturn a ruling allowing absentee ballots received after Election Day to be counted. Joe Hinkey tracking the story. In late August, a federal judge ruled absentee ballots in Georgia should be accepted up to three days past the November election date, as long as the absentee ballots are postmarked by election day. Now the state and federal Republican parties are asking for that ruling to be overturned. The ruling came from U.S. District Judge Eleanor Ross in response to a lawsuit from the voter registration organization New Georgia Project. State law previously required all absentee ballots to be received by county election officials by 7 p.m. on election day. The ruling was based on increased absentee ballot requests during the COVID-19 pandemic. Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger quickly appealed the ruling to the 11th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. In this 32-page brief filed today in federal court, the Republican National Committee and Georgia Republican Party are supporting Raffensperger's appeal. The brief argues Georgia voters have more than ample opportunity to vote. They have an expansive time frame to vote absentee. It mentions ballot requests can be made up to 180 days before the election. Absentee ballots can be received up to 49 nine days before the election and returned by mail, Dropbox, hand delivered or even canceled if a voter later decides to vote in person. Georgia Republican Party Chairman David Schaefer wrote in a statement, Democrats have filed a barrage of frivolous lawsuits seeking to eliminate election safeguards, sow confusion and upend the timely and accurate counting of votes. New Georgia Project lawsuit only named 17 of the state's 159 counties, including the state's most populous counties such as Fulton, DeKalb, Cobb and Gwinnett. The Republican brief filed today claims the plaintiffs picked counties with traditionally higher support for Democratic candidates. And if the ruling stands, the extended window for accepting absentee ballots would only apply to those 17 counties, while voters elsewhere would be handled differently. Well, it is National Voter Registration Day, and Clayton State University is stepping up to prepare voters. The university held a virtual voter education event today. It was one of several held across Metro Atlanta today for National Voter Registration Day. The event offered a self-guided tutorial on the registration process. Participants also learned how to verify and update their voter information, how to request and submit an absentee ballot, and more. Here at 11 Alive, we want to help you make sure your vote is secure. So for a full list of resources and key dates ahead of November's election, you can head over to 11alive.com slash vote. The fight to fill the vacant U.S. Supreme Court seat is on next to look at how the Senate vote could play out. Well, your 11 Alive storm trackers welcomed in the first day of fall today. It started at 9.31 a.m. with a low of 51 degrees. 
and a high of only 71 degrees. Nice crisp fall weather. So coming up, the changes you can expect and when the rain is going to make a pretty big time return. And something that does. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote that. There are a lot of questions surrounding who will be nominated to the open seat on the U.S. Supreme Court left vacant by the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The president expected to announce on Saturday his decision. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell can either push the vote through before the election or wait until after taking the pressure off Republicans up for re-election. So do Republicans have the votes to confirm a new Supreme Court justice? Right now, Republicans hold a majority in the Senate with 53 seats. Vice President Mike Pence is in position to break a 50-50 tie. Now, that means that four Republicans would have to go against the rest of their party to block the appointment. Republican Senators Lisa Murkowski and Susan Collins have already said they want to wait until after the election to vote on a new justice. That means that two more Republicans would have to break ranks to block the appointment. But with Senator Mitt Romney today saying that he supports moving forward with a vote on the president's nomination, Democrats' chances for stopping a vote would look to be very slim at this point. With 35 Senate seats up for grabs in November, including both of Georgia's seats, Time is rolling by. Special elections like the ones for Senator Kelly Leffler, the current seat with the seat in Arizona with Mark Kelly. Uh, those are places where Democrats see opportunity. The winners of those special elections could be sworn in prior to January, meaning there is a small chance. They could have a say in the appointment vote if it ends up happening shortly after the November election. Well, many of our 11 Alive storm trackers on our Facebook page posting uh, happy fall pictures, including Scott Anna at 931. He captured the first minute of fall in the North Georgia mountains. A beautiful shot. Lots of blue skies. Just a few high clouds starting to scoot in earlier today. And you notice, can you see any fall colors here? Most of it's green, but there's one orange tree right there and i think in the weeks to come we'll be seeing more of those orange colors popping up in the north georgia mountains clouds are on the increase right now we'll continue to see them thicken up in the overnight hours that was a downtown shot of noonan uh, this evening as the clouds start to roll in there are a few light returns showing up on the radar so it wouldn't surprise me if there wasn't a sprinkle or two but nothing organized out there until we get to thursday and that's when we'll see tropical depression beta moving in now our atmosphere has been incredibly 
dry, where you see the bluish purple color on the map, that is nice dry air that we've had wedged in here the last couple of days. It gave us that crisp fall pattern. But you can see the atmosphere starting to moisten up with those orange and yellow colors on the map. And that's moisture associated with tropical depression beta, which has been bringing in 13 to 14 inches of rain in the Houston area as it creeps along. And it was moving at around two miles per hour earlier today. Now it's up to five miles per hour, a little better pace, almost a walking pace to the east northeast. So it will slowly move in our direction weakening as it comes, but it will have some tropical moisture associated with it. So some of that moisture will get pulled in here for Thursday and Friday, and that could fuel some heavier downpours and some possible thunderstorms as we head into the end of the week and the beginning of the weekend. This is a slow-moving system, so it will affect us for a couple of days. 71 was our high today, 51 our low. We should be around 80 and 63, so we're in seasonably cool today on this date, so not bad for the first day of fall. In fact, some of those temperatures down in the mid-40s in Rome and Dalton at 46, Peachtree City and Covington both down to 48, 49 in Athens and 39, 39 in Blairsville. So we've hit the 30s now in the Blairsville area. So we're looking at these temperatures overnight getting down only into the upper 50s. It won't be quite as chilly. We're going to see those clouds thicken up. That acts as a blanket and kind of insulates in a bit of the warmth. And then as we head into tomorrow, we'll end up seeing those clouds, mostly cloudy skies at times, a few peaks of sunshine during the afternoon, and temperatures will be in the uh, mid-70s as we head into the afternoon hours. So we'll end up seeing temperatures warm up just a little bit from where we were today. So a gradual warming trend. The air is going to become more humid. So overnight tonight, we'll see some of those clouds rolling in so expect to see things pretty overcast tomorrow as you walk the kids to the bus stop as we head into the afternoon and evening you can end up seeing those uh, clouds continue to linger here as we head in through the afternoon and then the rain will start to move in as we head into Thursday northwest Georgia will see the showers first and then we'll see some heavier downpours as we head into the afternoon and evening hours maybe some uh, thunderstorms here as we get into late Thursday evening and then into Friday as well. So those rainfall amounts we're expecting to see around an inch and a half to two and a half inches across North Georgia with the heaviest mounts in the North Georgia mountains it looks like right now. You can see the heaviest uh, colors there in red, two and a half to four inches over the Tennessee Valley stretching back into the Mississippi River Valley. So we're expecting a pretty good dousing, an inch and a half to two and a half inches. We'll watch for that flood potential as we head towards the end of the week. So tomorrow looks pretty good, but cloudier and a little warmer. On our Thursday and Friday, we have a really good chance of seeing some showers and storms. 50% chance on Thursday, 60% chance on Friday, a 40% chance on Saturday, and then a 30% chance on Sunday. And wouldn't you as soon as the weekend wraps up, we'll dry it out and we'll see uh, a dry start to our beginning of our next work week. Isn't that always the way, Sam? Thank you. Well, the shelter in place orders for COVID-19 have left some seniors in nursing homes feeling isolated and alone, but a group of bus drivers is making sure one special senior knows that he is loved. Caitlin Ross brings us the story of how a morning walk turned into a powerful friendship. 94 year old Oli is the first to sign up for any group activity at his assisted living home. He loves art and horses and root beer floats. And now he found a whole new group of people to love the bus drivers from the local elementary school. No matter the weather, 94 year old Oli never misses his morning walk. I see him walking on the, on the sidewalk and he had his oxygen tank in his walker, sometimes an umbrella, and he would be so just he'd stop look and wave and a big smile. Woodstock school bus driver Stacy Childers got to know Oli's route as well as her own and came to depend on seeing him every day. He makes us all happy. Though they never spoke, she figured out he had to be living at an assisted living center just down the street. She called them up to see if she could learn more about the man who always made her morning better. And I sent him a card and just told him that we appreciate him and, all, and he uh, wrote me back and I got it yesterday. It was just nice to get to know who he was, this man on the sidewalk. The man on the sidewalk is 94-year-old Oli Doty. The World War II veteran is a resident at Camilla Place in Woodstock and went on lockdown with the rest of the world during the pandemic. But Oli was restless and wanted to keep up his walking routine five miles a day. This gives me time to say, walk. I, I can't sit still, I guess. It was on those daily walks that he came to know the bus drivers at Woodstock Elementary School, at first just by their bus numbers, 
But then they started writing to each other. Makes me feel good to talk to them. They talk to me. I, they're the heroes, not me. Eventually, the drivers wanted to meet Oli in person. So they set up a safe outdoor meetup where they served Oli's favorite, root beer floats. His daughter came to the celebration and says her dad is blown away by their kindness. He's always been a people person, so now he has a connection with the community, even though he's under quarantine. I love him. <laughs> I love him all. Oli's walking record is seven miles in one day. When I asked him how he does it, he says he just keeps moving, and he wants to keep up the routine until he's at least 100 years old. He knows his new friends will be cheering him on. All right, Caitlin, thank you. There's certainly a different field of sports this year. Uh, Braves can clinch another division title, maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow, maybe the next night. But when it happens, what will it look like without fans in the stadium? And will they do anything that you might recognize with champagne or other libations? The excitement really begins with the playoffs. Hard to believe. Starts next week. The pandemic is putting extra stress on women who are struggling to balance work and caring for their families. Next in primetime, a closer look at the tough choices women and girls are facing. WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Women all over the world have been feeling the impacts of COVID-19, with many saying the pandemic has forced them to choose between caring for their children and making a living. The United Nations is making a push to change all of that. Here's NBC's Keir Simmons. They are numbers that show parents under pressure. One in five working age adults in the U.S. say they can't do their job because coronavirus has disrupted their childcare. And women aged 25 to 44 are three times as likely not to be working because of childcare demands. Statistics that worry Amina Mohammed, as the United Nations Deputy Secretary General, she's the most senior woman in the UN and a parent herself. I have two sons and four daughters, and now I'm a grandmother of two. Congratulations. The shutdown didn't just take kids out of school. It took people out of work as well. Um, as we opened up for work, we didn't open up as quickly for education. And then that, I think, is where the, the real tough uh, um, challenges come. 
In April, the UN estimated schools were closed in 191 countries, affecting 1.5 billion students. There are parents, many of them moms, who are having to make a choice between feeding their children and educating their children. Yes, that shouldn't be a choice any woman or any family should ever have to make, not in 2020. There is the money to help, she says. Parents shouldn't have to face it alone. Otherwise, she warns, this crisis is impacting women and girls disproportionately, even more so in poorer countries where lack of education is catastrophic. You've almost shut down any chance of them is aspiring, inspiring, dreaming, reimagining uh, what their life could be after COVID. She worries too, with people forced to stay home, about rising cases of domestic violence. And I think people just have to remember what it's like uh, to be in that closed environment without any support. Um, uh, and, and to, you know, we need to reach out. This week, as the United Nations General Assembly meets virtually, marking 75 years since its foundation, the UN will renew its focus on 17 key goals, including ending inequality. Supported by big names like Beyonce. And we leverage um, the capacity of Beyonce to touch people's hearts with a message that really matters, then you've gone out to hundreds of millions of people. I mean, I'm still trying to get my Twitter following to hers, but haven't quite found the right tweet yet. Ultimately, Amina Mohammed says, the message for all our communities, support each other. And everybody always says, fine, if I ask you now, how are you? I'm, I'm great, thanks. And I'm, no, really, how are you? And then you stop to think. And then it's suddenly, actually, I'm not doing so okay. This is a problem for me. And you just need to take five, ten minutes out of a day and pay attention to that because that person could just be on the edge and you could be the hand that pulls them back. It's fascinating. He's Still ahead in prime time, there is a lot of skepticism behind the causes of death when it comes to COVID-19. We're looking at if the data reported each and every day is telling the real story. <laughs> Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. 
Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. The worst possible outcome for contracting COVID-19 obviously is death, but there has been some debate on whether the numbers are telling the real story. Would these people have died anyway? Reveal investigator Rebecca Lindstrom explains why she no longer wrestles with that question. He had a huge heart. When I asked Felicia Selkirk to gather some pictures of her dad, she paused. You no, know, it's, it's definitely a, a sore spot. There have been moments and days where it was hard for me because I have so many pictures of him in my phone where I didn't want to even open my phone. Pictures of her dad's time in the Army, his master's in theology at Harvard, or his yearly stint as Santa at a homeless shelter for women and children. And for the longest time, I did not realize that he was not Santa. <laughs> family photos marking moves from Boston to California and a love that lasted 45 years. But in March at age 67, Frank Selkirk was dead. What would you say killed your father? I would definitely say COVID killed my father. COVID is listed on his death certificate. So is pneumonia. Frank also had high blood pressure and an irregular heartbeat. In the COVID data, he is one of those listed with underlying health conditions. But Felicia says people need to understand none of that caused his death. I need people to know that this is real. This life taken is real. This hurt is real. This pain is real. His absence is real. The CDC analyzes deaths from the past three years to figure out how many people are likely to die now. Right around COVID, you can see that number slowly starting to tick up, peaking the week of April 11th when 42% more people died than expected. 21% of those deaths were associated with COVID. Dr. Amber Schmidtke says it's just one reason she pushes back against the notion that these people would have died anyway. I think that this is misinformation. Dr. Schmidtke points to this chart to show us what's happening. You see, there was an abnormal spike at the beginning of 2018. It was a really bad flu season. And 2020 is the only other time we see a spike over the past five years. And it's a big one. It's really pretty easy to see the stark difference in how many deaths we're experiencing this year compared to past years. And that's honestly the way that I like to look at what is the true impact of COVID-19. If you break it down by race, you can see for deaths not related to COVID, black people had a few bumps in the trend. But factor in COVID and the line jumps. The same for white people. Happy birthday to you. Frank and his granddaughter share birthdays three days apart, so each year they'd pick a day in the middle to celebrate. This was their last one together. Anymore. He's always in our heart. Felicia thought her father was getting better when she received a call. She had two minutes to say goodbye. The nurse told me that I only had two minutes because she was very hot and that that's about as much time that she could give me in his room. We said a prayer together and he said, tell everyone I love them. And those were his last words. He was just a very awesome person. Some of the people who died this year didn't have COVID, but it was still a factor. A spike in dementia-related deaths is blamed on isolation after nursing homes went on lockdown. And delays in routine medical care have also had an impact. Public transparency is going to be key when a COVID vaccine is finally available because a lot of people are hesitant about new vaccinations. NBC News medical correspondent Dr. John Torres has more on how public health officials are planning to get a vaccine to communities in need. COVID vaccine and distribution concerns. I'm here in Denver at the Center for African American Health where they've put up a pop-up flu vaccine clinic. I just got my flu vaccine a few minutes ago. Took around three minutes, it was easy. 
And it's important to get that flu vaccine down to people of color in these communities to make sure they're protected. But equally important is what's gonna happen when the COVID-19 vaccine becomes available and distribution becomes an even bigger problem. And that's why they've set up this flu clinic to dry run what they can do when that vaccine becomes available. Now, the important part is getting that vaccine to people who need it. And that includes people in community of color. Historically in the past, there have been a distrust of the medical system by people in these communities. So getting community facilities, getting community leaders involved to get the vaccine down to these members is gonna be extremely important, especially once that COVID-19 vaccine becomes available. Now, as far as the flu vaccine, now is a perfect time to get it. You wanna make sure you get it by the end of October to make sure you're protected, at least from the flu, before the twindemic hits. Well, if you have questions about the overlap between flu season and COVID-19, you can text them to us at the number there on your screen, 404-885-7600. We're going to take your questions directly to our 11 Alive medical correspondent, Dr. Sujatha Reddy, because we want you to be informed and prepared. She'll answer your top questions tomorrow on 11 Alive at 5. Fast food giant McDonald's signaled a change in the company's marketing strategy recently. CNBC's Kate Rogers explains how a celebrity endorsement targeted at younger customers is already paying off. I'm Travis Scott. This is my McDonald's order. Follow me. McDonald's doing something it hasn't done in decades, unveiling a new meal and merchandise line with Grammy-nominated rapper Travis Scott. The first celebrity meal edition since Michael Jordan's Mick Jordan in 1992. Scott, whose label is called Cactus Jack, is particularly popular with Gen Z and younger millennials. And fans agreed it was definitely lit. The company said in a statement, it's been so lit some of our restaurants have temporarily sold out of some of the ingredients in the meal. But McDonald's isn't the only brand leaning into Gen Z marketing. Duncan recently unveiled its collaboration with TikTok's biggest star, Charlie D'Amelio, offering the Charlie drink on menus. Chipotle also launched in-app group ordering with a family TikTok challenge this month called hashtag Chipotle Sponsor Us. Juicy burrito, make Taco Bell look weak. Looking for five families to give free burritos to. So why all this focus on Gen Z? Well, food matters to them a lot. Piper Sandler data show food is continually Gen Z's number one wallet priority. McDonald's, Dunkin' and Chipotle are also in the top five brands of importance for this growing cohort of spenders. Since the start of COVID-19, the outdoors have become an escape for many looking to reboot from a day of remote working and virtual learning. But now one local woman is using the backdrop of a West Side Trail to boost others with signs of positivity. Here's Liza Lucas. The next time you're on the Proctor Creek Greenway, take a pause. You might encounter a surprise, a sign, a message your soul needed to hear. Such inspiration found sprinkled along this popular path. Anastasia Fussell and friends taking extra paint and extra time at home to reach others. For me, this project started out years ago. So I always thought it'd be really cool to do some public art. And you know, now with COVID and kind of everything that happened, it seemed like a really good time to have some positive messages to, to put out there to cheer people up. Her creations tucked into trees, messages blending into the background. I think a lot of people are kind of reconnecting with nature nowadays. It was a good place to reach them with these little messages of positivity and really hoping to bring smiles to someone's face. And while some of the art may wander off, this artist doesn't mind. I'm glad that people are taking them because I'm hoping that, you know, they're taking it home and it brings some joy there as well. So on the days when life is getting you down, look up. You may see what you need to keep going. You didn't order anything, so what's that Amazon package doing on the doorstep? Well, we're going to explain why it could be part of a scam. Well, we're going to see some changes as we head into the overnight hours. The atmosphere is starting to moisten up and the clouds are rolling in. So coming up, when you can expect this return of the showers and the thunderstorms during the rest of this week.
Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Prime Time, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part. Tense situation for more than six hours today with two neighborhoods in East Cobb put on lockdown. Tracy A. McPhear tells us what happened. At around 5.30 this morning, neighbors here on Kingsley Drive started calling 911 after shots were fired inside and outside a nearby house. Police tell us some houses were even hit. Cobb County Police responded with SWAT teams and negotiators, locking down both the Newcastle and Arthur's Vineyard neighborhoods. Well, you know, this is East Cobb, nothing ever happens here. <laughs> you know, Leaving people boring, like you know, Philip Neal trying to figure out the safest place in his house to ride it out. It's a little scary. Um, you know, I lived here my whole life and there's never been any, at least major issues, you know, that I've ever known of. Sergeant Wayne Delk says the gunman was the only person in the house. A little after noon, after six hours of negotiations, the suspect was taken into custody. This ended the way we wanted it to. Uh, a peaceful resolution subject is in custody and we have no injuries to anyone. Delg tells us the gunman faces charges that range from discharging a firearm near a roadway to aggravated assault. Well, happy fall, everyone, and what a beautiful fall day it was. It couldn't have been any nicer. We had a lot of sunshine, blue skies, and just a few clouds out there to make it interesting. Many of our storm trackers talking about the beautiful clouds that they photographed today, including Linda Collins and Bishop, showing these puffy cumulus clouds mixed with some mare's tails, some high cirrus clouds as well. So clouds will be moving in overnight. In fact, there are a few returns showing up on radar. I know many of the radar apps are saying rain's starting soon, but I think it's going 
to take a while before the atmosphere really moistens up. Despite the fact we have a few returns showing up on radar, I think they're evaporating before they hit the ground. Just too dry yet, but it will be moistening up as we head into the next 24 to 48 hours. And you can see what's heading our way. This is tropical uh, depression beta that has been dumping heavy rain on the Houston area. 13 to 14 inches of rain in the Houston area. That is a lot of rain in an area that's very near to sea level and very prone to flooding. And that moisture extending now into Arkansas, Louisiana, into the western Tennessee Valley, and slowly migrating in our direction. So we'll see an increase in the clouds definitely for our Wednesday. Temperatures this morning were on the chilly side today in Blairsville, 39 degrees. We were at 46 in Dalton and Rome, 49 in Athens, 48 in Carrollton and in Peachtree City. It was a crisp, perfect start to fall this morning. And then high temperatures were just as cool this afternoon. We were at 68 in Carrollton, 72 in Canton, 71 in Gainesville, and 71 in Atlanta. So temperatures running just around 10 degrees or so below average for this time of year. So overnight, we'll see those clouds thickening up, rolling in, and that'll keep our temperatures from being quite as chilly tomorrow. We'll be in the upper 50s as we head out the door tomorrow morning, right around 57 degrees. During the afternoon, we'll get in the mid-70s. Plenty of cloud cover moving in with just a few peaks of sunshine, but we don't think we'll see any rain yet. Nothing organized anyway. That rain won't be moving in until Thursday. But throughout the day tomorrow, plenty of cloud cover. We'll see those temperatures in the uh, low to mid-70s for much of the afternoon. Overall, a pretty pleasant day to get things done. It won't be too hot. It won't be too cool. Kind of just right with a mix of cloud cover and a little bit of sunshine. So as we head into the overnight, this is what our rapid refresh radar is showing. It's showing some of these returns trying to work their way in here. So if you run into a sprinkle or two, it's not out of the question as we head into the late evening hours and even into the overnight hours. And those clouds will continue to thicken up as you head out the door. Uh, tomorrow morning, it's going to look pretty cloudy, I think, pretty overcast. So this is what we're expecting overnight as the clouds roll in and thicken up. We'll end up seeing a few breaks in the clouds during the day. That'll allow us to have a little bit of sunshine as we head into the afternoon hours. And then once we get into Thursday, we'll see those clouds very widespread to start as well. And then those showers starting to move in to West Georgia as we head into the afternoon and then by the evening hours, can some pretty heavy downpours look possible here in Rome, uh, stretching up into Dalton, and then moving in throughout the late evening on Thursday and sticking with us on Friday. So we'll likely end up seeing around an inch and a half to two and a half inches, with some spots getting as much as three inches of rain. It's a tropical air mass, so where we see some of those thunderstorms, we can see some very heavy downpours. So that's what we'll be looking at as we head into our Thursday and Friday, and then into the weekend as well. So here's Beta, what's left of it, a tropical depression moving to the east-northeast at five miles per hour. It was creeping and crawling along the Texas coastline the last couple of days. We're expecting storm totals around East Texas to be around 20 inches. So that is a lot of rain in a short period of time. Uh, and then that's going to continue into Louisiana, into Mississippi, Alabama, and pull a little moisture in here. So that'll be responsible for fueling some of our showers and storms on our Thursday, Friday, and into the beginning of the weekend as well. So that is Tropical Depression Beta. You've probably heard about Teddy. We've been talking about Teddy now. It was a powerful hurricane. It is now post-tropical, but it still has hurricane force winds of 85 miles per hour, moving into the Canadian Maritimes at 18 miles per hour, so moving really fast. Huge waves here up along the east coast, especially in the northeast and the eastern Canadian coast here. Now, as it moves to the north, it will weaken, but it's still bringing in some powerful storm winds as we head into the next 48 hours. So they are going to be blustery across much of eastern Canada the next couple of days. And then Paulette, that was the P storm. We're all the way through uh, our list of storm names, and now we're into the Greek alphabet with beta. So Paulette actually was downgraded for a while, and then it came back to life once again. So a lot of people attributing that to 2020. Right now, just meandering around the eastern Atlantic. It will continue to weaken as we head into the next couple of days, but I think we need to keep our eyes on Paulette because once she gets caught up in the easterlies once again, I shouldn't say she, they don't really have a gender, so I should say once Paulette gets caught up in the easterly flow, it could bring it in our direction once again out into the Atlantic, 
And all bets are off. Anything could happen with Paulette at this point. But the next two days does show signs of weakening. Okay, so here's your seven-day forecast. Calling for a dry day on Wednesday, but cloudy and gray and a little warmer, but still below our seasonal norms. Thursday and Friday, we see temperatures in the 70s for highs, low 60s for lows, and a good chance of thunderstorms. 50% chance on Thursday, 60% chance on our Friday, 40% chance on Saturday, and then 30% chance on Sunday. And then as the weekend ends, we dry it out, and it looks like the beginning of next week is pretty warm in the low 80s, and we'll see uh, things drying out as we head into our Monday and Tuesday. Sam, thank you. Well, have you ever received a package in the mail that's addressed to you, filled out and everything, but you definitely don't remember ordering? More and more people say this is happening to them, and when one woman started asking questions, she uncovered a scam. Bianca Buno with our sister station in Phoenix is looking at how it all works. So the first time I got it, I opened it, I was like, I didn't order that. Hannah Muskoka of North Phoenix was sure it was a mistake. An Amazon package showing up to her door with her name and address, but she had never ordered it. I had to run to my Amazon account and have to like search through, like, did I order this? She didn't. Then the random packages kept coming from blackout curtains and ice trays to fake eyelashes and a nose hair trimmer. I've gotten um, batteries one time. I just got batteries randomly and I was like, thanks whoever you are because I could always use these. <laughs> While Hannah didn't mind the free merchandise, she wondered where these senders got her personal information. So she started digging. It's just really creepy. But we definitely class as, classify this as a scam. According to the Better Business Bureau, Hannah is not alone. In fact, she's one of many targets of a new scam called brushing. The main reason behind these scams are so that the third party retailers can create false verified reviews. And the better reviews, the better the sales. That's false reporting to consumers. Amazon well aware of the problem, telling 12 News in a statement, third party sellers are prohibited from sending unsolicited packages to customers. And we take action on those who violate our policies. As for Hannah, she says the packages haven't stopped, making her a more skeptical shopper, now suspicious of reviews that seem too good to be true. I've definitely double thought everything now on Amazon, for sure. All right, so if this does happen to you, you should reach out and contact Amazon's customer service department and change your account passwords. And if you're wondering, the Federal Trade Commission says you are legally allowed to keep whatever you've received. Coming up next, the battle on Capitol Hill over filling the seat on the country's highest court. We're verifying whether the Constitution allows for Congress to change the number of justices, depending on how this plays out. Four sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. 
Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough. Vice President Mike Pence vowing today to fill that seat as the battle swirls on Capitol Hill over replacing late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Presidential candidate Joe Biden told reporters today he is punting on the hypothetical idea of expanding the court if the vacancy is filled before November's election. The nation now closely watching what happens next and in the middle of this debate, people have been questioning whether the Constitution actually allows for the number of justices to change. Evan Kozloff from our Verify team has the answer. The Verify team is here for you throughout this upcoming Supreme Court nomination process. And obviously, we're hearing a lot right now from politicians. If you're on the Verify team, we're just going to focus on the facts. If you look online, you're going to see a lot of posts like this, suggesting that if Democrats take back control of Congress in 2020, they could add seats to the Supreme Court. Some say two new justices, some say four, some are saying many more than that. So we're gonna verify, does the Constitution allow the number of Supreme Court justices to be changed? Here are sources, Article 3, Section 1 of the Constitution. This FAQ page from the Supreme Court website. Absolutely, no hesitation, clearly yes. And Adam Levitin from Georgetown Law. Let's start with the Constitution. It reads, the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court, and that the judges, quote, shall hold their offices during good behavior. But this section says nothing about the number of justices. Congress can change the number of justices on the court whenever it feels like, and historically it has. In fact, there were some big fluctuations in early American history. In 1789, the first Judiciary Act set the number of justices to six. During the Civil War, it got up to 10. In 1869, Congress settled it on nine justices. That's been the number we've had for the last 150 plus years, but there's nothing magic about it. It's just that's kind of where we we set the set the number historically. And the last time that there was a push to change the number was in 1937 with President Franklin Roosevelt. But in the end, that effort failed. So we can verify that, yes, Congress, along with a signature from the president, can change the number of justices. But this hasn't been done for more than 150 years. Can they? Absolutely. Will they? Less clear. Still ahead on primetime, President Trump making another trip to Metro Atlanta this week. The signs Georgia is increasingly becoming a crucial state to win in the November election. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. 
Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touch. Health experts continue to sound the alarm about smoking and vaping at any time, but particularly during the pandemic. They believe that smoking and vaping can increase a person's chances of contracting COVID-19, and it can lead to more serious outcomes. They are narrowing in on the possible reasons as to why. Here's NBC's Sarah Dolliff. These two receptors that may serve as entry points for coronavirus. Smokers often have more than non-smokers. Clearly patients with lung disease smokers do worse and the connection is that ACE2 receptors. Cedar Sinai Dr. Zab Mozenafar says smokers who do contract the virus tend to get sicker and may have an increased chance of being hospitalized or placed on a ventilator. Stop smoking, help us help you. It's a plea amplified by health experts nationwide who say no age group is safe. A Stanford University School of Medicine study found young people who vape were more likely to contract coronavirus than non-users. If you have ever used an electronic cigarette, you are five times more likely to be diagnosed with COVID-19. The American Lung Association launching a new campaign. He would never try it. Encouraging parents to talk to their kids about the dangers of vaping. Conversations that are especially important right now, says pediatric pulmonologist Dr. Christy Sadramelli. Doing something that could hurt your lungs right now in the time of a respiratory disease pandemic is just not a great idea. The pandemic providing more reasons to extinguish those lights for good. Right now on primetime, President Trump planning to make a stop in Metro Atlanta this week. House supporters hope he'll use his visit to propel his campaign past opponent Joe Biden. With the November election edging closer, a look at efforts to get out the vote in Georgia, plus growing support to extend the deadline for absentee votes. And a sweet story of friendship found in the unlikeliest of places during a pandemic. How momentary relief from quarantine led to lasting connections. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. All right, folks, we're just uh, 42 uh, days away from the November general election with the first presidential debate one week from tonight, Aisha. On Friday, President Trump is planning an appearance in Atlanta. The details are still in the works, but the campaign is hoping he'll hold a rally that includes Black Voices for Trump, a group the president introduced in Atlanta last year. 11 Alive's Doug Richards is taking a closer look. In 2016, Donald Trump won Georgia with the thinnest Republican winning presidential margin in 20 years. In 2020, Republicans view Georgia as a state Trump cannot afford to lose. I really believe my father was, was put here for a reason. Last week, the president's son, Eric, spoke to a rally in Forsyth County. This week, his daughter, Ivanka, was in Atlanta with the attorney general. It's no surprise President Trump would also set his sights in Georgia, says State Senator Valencia C., who supports Democrat Joe Biden. They know that Georgia is turning blue, so they are coming here to try to make a difference. But we are lined up and we are ready to turn Georgia blue. He does not hate blacks. He does not hate illegals. Ten months ago, President Trump visited Georgia to launch a group called Black Voices for Trump an effort to broaden Trump's appeal into a population of voters who have spent much of the last 50 years supporting Democrats. 
Since then, his campaign claims Trump volunteers and staff have knocked on a half million doors in Georgia and is running ads here showing African-American supporters of the president. I will vote for President Trump because he cares about people like me. A lot of us can agree, you know, hey, black lives matter, but we are seeing communities and businesses being destroyed. So I think people are saying, wait a minute. Angela Stanton King expects Trump's effort in Georgia to succeed and to help lift her candidacy. She's a Republican running for Congress to replace the late John Lewis. She faces Democrat Nakima Williams in a very Democratic district. And if we've been voting Democrat 140 years, why not give a Republican a shot? Georgia needs to be back in Democratic control. Senator C says that Biden will get a boost in Georgia this year because he chose Kamala Harris as his running mate. What Biden has not done is schedule a campaign event here. So one day after his visit, President Trump says he will announce his Supreme Court nominee to succeed the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And it appears Senate Republicans have the votes to move that process forward. History and precedent were on this Senate majority side in 2016, and they are overwhelmingly on our side now. Leader McConnell has basically decided the rules don't apply to Republicans, even their own rules. McConnell is in position to either push the vote through before the election or wait until after taking the pressure off vulnerable Republicans up for re-election. Now, he has the power to decide, with Republicans holding a 53 to 47 majority in the Senate. In the event of a tie, Vice President Mike Pence can cast the deciding vote under the, his constitutional office as president of the Senate. Since assuming office... Vice President Pence has cast a tie-breaking vote 13 times. Today is National Voter Registration Day when Americans are urged to register or double-check their registration status to ensure they are able to vote on November 3rd. Hundreds of national and community groups took part in the push to get people ready for Election Day. In Georgia, you have until October 5th to register and be eligible to vote in the November election. For the 2016 presidential election, there were just under five and a half million active registered voters across the state. By the November 2018 gubernatorial election, that number grew by about one million voters. According to the Secretary of State's office, most Georgians who recently registered to vote did so through the Department of Driver Services. Your information is now automatically updated when you change the address on your driver's license. A distant second for most common methods to register is by mailing in your voter application. That's followed by online registration. There are several other ways for Georgians to register, including county election offices, public libraries, high schools and colleges, or state offices where benefits are distributed. Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger is appealing a federal ruling that would extend the deadline for absentee ballots to be received. Joe Henke has more on how other Republican leaders are showing their support for this appeal. The federal court ruling in late August announced that Georgia absentee ballots could be received and still counted up to three days after Election Day, as long as they were postmarked by Election Day. Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger quickly appealed the decision, and today he received some support. In a 32-page brief, the Georgia Republican Party and Republican National Committee are asking for the federal court ruling to be overturned. The ruling was in response to a lawsuit from the New Georgia Project, which sought to change absentee ballot deadlines due to the increased response for such ballots during the COVID-19 pandemic. While neither the original lawsuit nor the brief filed today estimate how many votes could be impacted, in the brief, Republicans claim the New Georgia Project only named counties with traditionally higher support for Democratic candidates. The lawsuit did only list 17 counties, including some of the state's most populous, such as Fulton, DeKalb, Cobb, and Gwinnett. The brief filed today states if the federal ruling is not overturned, absentee ballots received after Election Day would be accepted in those counties, but rejected in the state's 142 other counties. State law previously required all absentee ballots to be received by county election officials by 7 p.m. on Election Day. The Republican written brief filed today supporting Raffensperger's appeal, though, states with the ability to request an absentee ballot up to 180 days before an election, receive the ballot up to 49 days before Election Day, and then have multiple ways to return it from mail to drop box and hand delivery means that Georgia voters have more than ample opportunity to vote. 
11alive.com slash vote is where you'll find everything you need to prepare for Election Day, from important dates to information on applying to be a poll worker. It is all on 11alive.com and the 11 Alive app. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers talking to you on TV as well as talking to about 200 people on Facebook Live right now where we are talking about the changes that are on the way. That's why you see my phone right here. That's how I'm talking to those folks on Facebook Live. So if you want to talk to us also about the weather and uh, have more of a conversation about the weather and see the behind the scenes stuff, go to my Facebook page, Chris Holcomb 11 Alive, and you can join that conversation. Now I want to show you something really interesting. We have on radar clouds that are building in, and I know you see some green here indicating the potential for maybe just a couple of raindrops out there. I just ask all those folks on Facebook Live if they are actually seeing any of this making it to the ground, and the overwhelming response was no. And often what happens is we have this moisture in the upper levels, but it dries out before it hits the ground, and we think this is what's happening here. It is possible there might be a few drops here and there, but it's nothing really major. This moisture is well in advance of the main system that is still out to the west. This is beta. It is no longer a tropical storm. It's a tropical depression. Uh, the center of circulation is still hanging out right here along the coastline, but it is uh, over land instead of over water. It's just going to move right up the coast and still spreading in a lot of rain into parts of Texas, even uh, some heavier showers in that band that just went through the Houston area. Uh, take a look at the bigger picture and let me show you what we're watching out there for tonight. A uh, future radar shows that we're mainly going to be dealing with clouds as we go through the rest of the nighttime hours tonight and into tomorrow morning and even during the day tomorrow, mostly cloudy skies with a few peaks of sun here and there, but we're not really concerned about rain chances until we get into later in the day on Thursday and that's going to linger into Friday and even part of the day on Saturday. So stay with us. We'll, we'll put more of the timeline on that for you with our, our forecast track in just a few minutes. All right, Chris, thank you. You know, we were warned it could happen and now it has more than 200,000 Americans have now died from COVID-19. The number of deaths roughly equal the population of Augusta. Today, the solemn milestone was marked with an interfaith memorial service on the National Mall. The nation's top coronavirus expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, calling the news stunning. The idea of 200,000 deaths is really very sobering and in some respects stunning. The universal wearing of masks, the attention to keeping distance, the avoiding of crowds, the trying to do things outdoors more than indoors, frequent washing of hands. We've said them so many times, but they're not universally implemented and employed. In Georgia, more than 6,600 people have now died with the virus. 73 of those deaths were reported today alone. Even though we've seen the average number of the new cases drop weekly, the death rate remains high. Hospitalization has also remained steady with about 1,400 active patients each and every day. And we have not dipped below that number since early June. And with testing down dramatically, it's another sign that only those who are seriously ill are taking time to find out if they have the virus. Despite coronavirus concerns, fans are returning to Mercedes-Benz Stadium early next month. Today, the Atlanta Falcons and Atlanta United announced a limited number of fans will return to the stands beginning October 11th. That's when the Falcons host the Carolina Panthers. We're going to learn much more about what coronavirus protocols will be in place coming in the next few days. Don't forget, we are streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. Subscribe and join the conversation in the community section. More 11 Alive news in prime time coming up after the break. Stay with us. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. 
Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Within 24 hours, two people have died during officer-involved shootings in our area, with new details released on both cases today. Oconee County Sheriff's Department providing this body cam video right here after a woman was killed there yesterday. Uh, the department says that Julia Ann Moss appeared to be in a manic state after stabbing a dog and hitting a man with a metal pipe. The department says deputies tried to de-escalate the situation, but then Moss came at them with a knife, forcing a deputy to shoot her. And a man killed in a southeast Atlanta police shooting was also identified today. Investigators say Darian Bell was arguing with his wife yesterday. This is inside a car on Casanova Street when he pulled out a gun. GBI investigators say when he moved toward the officer, she shot him. Tonight, Latasha Givens is taking a closer look at the GBI investigation numbers this year compared to last year. This is how 2019 compares to 2020 when it comes to the number of officer-involved shooting cases GBI is investigating. The numbers include cases where an officer fired their weapon but may not have hit anyone. In 2019, GBI investigated 84 officer-involved shootings, 37 people died in those cases, three of them were officers. The pace of shootings is slower this year. So far in 2020, GBI has been called to investigate 37 cases. 34 people have been killed in addition to a K-9 officer. In 2019, DeKalb County, athens Clark County, Atlanta, Clayton County, and Richmond counties have had the most cases. In 2020 so far, Atlanta, Cobb County, Gwinnett County, and Georgia State Patrol have had the most. Yeah. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. You just heard me finishing my sentence here as I'm talking to the folks on Facebook Live. And we're still about 150 people uh, right now. And we're chatting about uh, the clouds that are building in. A lot of folks are saying that they're really enjoying this fall-like feel to the air. You know, today was the first day of fall. It started this morning at 931. And it actually felt like fall out there today. We had a lot of sunshine early on. Now we're watching the clouds increasing. They started off as high clouds. They're thickening up a little bit out there right now and I've been chatting with folks on Facebook Live. No one is confirming that this green that you're seeing there is actually hitting the ground. A lot of times on radar when we have a situation like this with these high clouds, there's moisture in the upper levels, but it evaporates before it makes it to the ground. There may be just one or two raindrops out there and all of this is well in advance. You can see this moisture here then dry in um, Alabama, most of Mississippi, and then you get into the rain in Louisiana, Arkansas, and especially back into Texas, and that's the rain associated with what's now Tropical Depression Beta, where the center of circulation is pretty much just right here along the coast. It's moving very slowly up toward the north and east, and that track is gonna continue as we go through the rest of the night and into the uh, overnight hours and really the next couple of days. Take a look at these temperatures. I wanna show this to you on the big screen so you can see what we're watching, 65 degrees, right now in Atlanta. Uh, 59 though in Athens, 59 in Covington, and then we also have some 50s up in Blairsville and also into Clayton. So really uh, mild air, actually cool air out there in some spots, and then 60s in others. Now what's happening is with those clouds that we have right now, it is not allowing it to cool down as quickly as it did last night and the night before. So these temperatures tonight are going to be, you know, kind of slowly going down during the overnight hours. In fact, you see this lower 60s, pretty much one, three in the morning and then into the 50s here early in the morning without cloud cover. It's almost like it's, it's, it's acting like a blanket holding in some of the heating of the day. Otherwise, with clear skies, it will be cooling a lot faster is the whole point. So here's what we're watching tomorrow. Starting off at about 57 degrees in the afternoon, we get up to 70, uh, 57 in the morning, we get up to 76 in the afternoon. We will see a better coverage of clouds tomorrow, mostly cloudy skies. We're going to give that a 9 on the wisometer because still it's not going to be producing any rain yet. So here's what we're watching tonight. Clouds around in the morning, mix of sun and clouds here, but generally more clouds than sunshine as we go through the day. And then not any rain here for your Wednesday. It's going to be on Thursday 
when we watch this moisture coming in from the west, some of that coming in over North Georgia a little bit earlier in the day. And then later in the afternoon is we're going to see a better coverage of rain that'll move in. And especially during the evening, some of these showers coming into Northwest Georgia might be a little bit heavier uh, for the late night hours on Thursday. And then we'll see even more rain coming in on Friday. And this is all in association with what we're watching with the remnants of data. This is a tropical depression right now. Max winds at about 30 miles an hour. See how the system just kind of hugs the coast. This is for tomorrow afternoon and then into Louisiana. It becomes a remnant low by Friday afternoon. This is the, the low pressure system that you see there is in North Alabama moving into Tennessee. That's going to be close enough to us. And again, with this flow around that picking up Gulf moisture, spreading it our way, bringing us some rain. Now, if you'll remember last night when I showed you these rain totals, I said this is probably going to change <laughs> because now we're seeing those heaviest rain amounts more in line with the track of the system. We are now calling for, you know, one to two inches of rain possible in some spots over North Georgia around Metro Atlanta. It may even be less than an inch of rain um, as we go through Thursday, Friday and also into Saturday as well. So uh, another thing we're watching post tropical system Teddy still strong winds there. Hurricane force winds going to be bringing in some wind, rain and crazy waves over parts of Nova Scotia and even the Northeast is having a lot of waves there too. 76 for high tomorrow with increased increasing clouds. We're at a 50% chance for showers on Thursday. That's really going to be later in the day. And then on Friday, a little better chance for showers with highs near 78. Rain chance coming down Saturday at 40%, Sunday at 30%. And we've taken the rain chances out for Monday and Tuesday. And notice those temperatures rising again into the lower 80s for the weekend and also the beginning of next week. The shelter in place orders for COVID-19 have left some seniors in nursing homes feeling really isolated and alone, but a group of bus drivers is making sure one senior knows he's loved. Caitlin Ross brings us the story of how a morning walk turned into a powerful friendship. 94 year old Oli is the first to sign up for any group activity at his assisted living home. He loves art and horses and root beer floats, and now he found a whole new group of people to love the bus drivers from the local elementary school. No matter the weather, 94-year-old Oli never misses his morning walk. I see him walking on the, on the sidewalk and he had his oxygen tank in his walker, sometimes an umbrella, and he would be so, just, he'd stop and look and wave and a big smile. Woodstock school bus driver Stacy Childers got to know Oli's route as well as her own and came to depend on seeing him every day. Though they never spoke, she figured out he had to be living at an assisted living center just down the street. She called them up to see if she could learn more about the man who always made her morning better. And I sent him a card and just told him that we appreciate him and all, and he uh, wrote me back and I got it yesterday. It was just nice to get to know who he was, this man on the sidewalk. The man on the sidewalk is 94-year-old Oli Doty. The World War II veteran is a resident at Camilla Place in Woodstock and went on lockdown with the rest of the world during the pandemic. But Oli was restless and wanted to keep up his walking routine five miles a day. And this gives me time to think and walk. I, I can't sit still, I guess. It was on those daily walks that he came to know the bus drivers at Woodstock Elementary School, at first just by their bus numbers. But then they started writing to each other. Makes me feel good to talk to them. They talk to me. I, they're the heroes, not me. Eventually, the drivers wanted to meet Oli in person. So they set up a safe outdoor meetup where they served Oli's favorite, root beer floats. His daughter came to the celebration and says her dad is blown away by their kindness. He's always been a people person, so now he has a connection with the community, even though he's under quarantine. I love him. <laughs> Oli's walking record is seven miles in one day. When I asked him how he does it, he says he just keeps moving and he wants to keep up the routine until he's at least 100 years old. He knows his new friends will be cheering him on. The pandemic is putting extra stress on women who are struggling to balance work and caring for their families next. A closer look at the tough process and the tough choices they're facing. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. 
the things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because a women all over the world have been feeling the impact of COVID-19 with a lot of them saying the pandemic has forced them to choose between caring for their children and making a living. The United Nations is making a push to change that. Here's NBC's Keir Simmons. They are numbers that show parents under pressure. One in five working age adults in the US say they can't do their job because coronavirus has disrupted their childcare. And women aged 25 to 44 are three times as likely not to be working because of childcare demands. Statistics that worry Amina Mohammed, as the United Nations Deputy Secretary General, she's the most senior woman in the UN and a parent herself. I have two sons and four daughters, and now I'm a grandmother of two. Congratulations. The shutdown didn't just take kids out of school. It took people out of work as well. Um, as we opened up for work, we didn't open up as quickly for education. And then that, I think, is where the, the real tough uh, um, challenges come. In April, the UN estimated schools were closed in 191 countries, affecting 1.5 billion students. There are parents, many of them moms, who are having to make a choice between feeding their children and educating their children. Yes, that shouldn't be a choice any woman or any family should ever have to make, not in 2020. There is the money to help, she says. Parents shouldn't have to face it alone. Otherwise, she warns, this crisis is impacting women and girls disproportionately, even more so in poorer countries where lack of education is catastrophic. You've almost shut down any chance of them is aspiring, inspiring, dreaming, reimagining uh, what their life could be after COVID. She worries too, with people forced to stay home, about rising cases of domestic violence. And I think people just have to remember what it's like uh, to be in that closed environment without any support. Um, uh, and, and to, you know, we need to reach out. This week is the United Nations General Assembly meets virtually, marking 75 years since its foundation. The UN will renew its focus on 17 key goals, including ending inequality. Supported by big names like Beyonce. And we leverage um, the capacity of Beyonce to touch people's hearts with a message that really matters, then you've gone out to hundreds of millions of people. I mean, I'm still trying to get my Twitter following to hers, but haven't quite found the right tweet yet. Ultimately, Amina Mohammed says, the message for all our communities 
support each other. And everybody always says, fine, if I ask you now, how are you? I'm, I'm great, thanks. And I'm, no, really, how are you? And then you stop to think. And then it's suddenly, actually, I'm not doing so okay. This is a problem for me. And you just need to take five, ten minutes out of the day and pay attention to that because that person could just be on the edge and you could be the hand that pulls them back. It's fascinating. He's there was a lot of skepticism behind the causes of death when it comes to COVID-19. Next, we're looking at if the data reported every day is telling the real story. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers. The worst possible outcome from contracting for contracting COVID-19, of course, is death. But there has been some debate on whether the numbers are telling the real story. Would these people have died anyway? Reveal investigator Rebecca Lindstrom explains why she no longer wrestles with that question. He had a huge heart. When I asked Felicia Selkirk to gather some pictures of her dad, she paused. You know, it's, it's definitely a, a sore spot. There have been moments and days where it was hard for me because I have so many pictures of him in my phone where I didn't want to even open my phone. Pictures of her dad's time in the Army, his master's in theology at Harvard, or his yearly stint as Santa at a homeless shelter for women and children. And for the longest time, I did not realize that he was not Santa. <laughs> family photos marking moves from Boston to California and a love that lasted 45 years. But in March at age 67, Frank Selkirk was dead. What would you say killed your father? I would definitely say COVID killed my father. COVID is listed on his death certificate. 
So is pneumonia. Frank also had high blood pressure and an irregular heartbeat. In the COVID data, he is one of those listed with underlying health conditions. But Felicia says people need to understand none of that caused his death. I need people to know that this is real. This life taken is real. This hurt is real. This pain is real. His absence is real. The CDC analyzes deaths from the past three years to figure out how many people are likely to die now. Right around COVID, you can see that number slowly starting to tick up, peaking the week of April 11th when 42% more people died than expected. 21% of those deaths were associated with COVID. Dr. Amber Schmidtke says it's just one reason she pushes back against the notion that these people would have died anyway. I think that this is misinformation. Dr. Schmidtke points to this chart to show us what's happening. You see, there was an abnormal spike at the beginning of 2018. It was a really bad flu season. And 2020 is the only other time we see a spike over the past five years. And it's a big one. It's really pretty easy to see the stark difference in how many deaths we're experiencing this year compared to past years. And that's honestly the way that I like to look at what is the true impact of COVID. 19. If you break it down by race, you can see for deaths not related to COVID, black people had a few bumps in the trend. But factor in COVID and the line jumps the same for white people. Happy birthday to you. Frank and his granddaughter share birthdays three days apart, so each year they'd pick a day in the middle to celebrate. This was their last one together. Anymore. He's always in our heart. Felicia thought her father was getting better when she received a call. She had two minutes to say goodbye. The nurse told me that I only had two minutes because she was very hot and that that's about as much time that she could give me in his room. We said a prayer together and he said, tell everyone I love them. And those were his last words. He was just a very awesome person. Some of the people who died this year didn't have COVID, but it was still a factor. A spike in dementia-related deaths is blamed on isolation after nursing homes went on lockdown. And delays in routine medical care have also had an impact. Public transparency is going to be key when the vaccine becomes available because a lot of people are really hesitant about a vaccine at all. They're really hesitant. NBC News correspondent Dr. John Torres has more on how public health officials are now planning to get a vaccine to communities in need. COVID vaccine and distribution concerns. I'm here in Denver at the Center for African American Health where they've put up a pop-up flu vaccine clinic. I just got my flu vaccine a few minutes ago. It took around three minutes, it was easy. And it's important to get that flu vaccine down to people of color in these communities to make sure they're protected. But equally important is what's gonna happen when the COVID-19 vaccine becomes available and distribution becomes an even bigger problem. And that's why they've set up this flu clinic to dry run what they can do when that vaccine becomes available. Now, the important part is getting that vaccine to people who need it. And that includes people in community of color. Historically in the past, there have been a distrust of the medical system by people in these communities. So getting community facilities, getting community leaders involved to get the vaccine down to these members is gonna be extremely important, especially once that COVID-19 vaccine becomes available. Now, as far as the flu vaccine, now is the perfect time to get it. You wanna make sure you get it by the end of October to make sure you're protected, at least from the flu, before the twindemic hits. So do you have questions about the overlap between flu season and COVID-19? Text them to us at the number on your screen right there. And then we're going to take your questions directly to 11 Alive medical correspondent Dr. Sujatha Reddy because we want you to be informed and prepared. She's going to answer some of your top questions. That's tomorrow at 5. About 80% of people say they can't imagine Halloween without trick-or-treating, according to the National Confectioner Association. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is saying that parents and children might have to start picturing it that way. 11 Alive's Brittany Klein-Peter has more tonight. Hey, happy Halloween. Here happy we go. Halloween. I'm basically going to miss all the costumes. I'm going to miss um, that.
Uh, sometimes I can take my mask off. So, like taking our friends with us to trick or treat. The Slaughter family plans on trick or treating this year, but it's going to look a lot different. On Tuesday, the CDC released new Halloween guidelines due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The federal health agency advises against door to door trick or treating. The CDC says it's too risky and you should also avoid hay rides and tractor rides with others. But there are safer alternatives for you and your family. Try one way direction paths for trick or treating where you can socially distance or set out pre bag candy bags at the edge of your yard or driveway. You don't have to ghost Halloween altogether. There's still ways to celebrate while minimizing the risk for COVID-19. You know, everything has been really upended this year and everyone's looking for a little bit of joy in their life. And Halloween is one of those moments that everyone can come together and celebrate in their own way. Despite the CDC's warnings, the debate over whether to trick or treat is definitely still mixed. One person on Facebook writing, incredible, the amount of people willing to risk lives, especially children's lives, all for candy. Another person writing, the CDC is trying to control us all. The CDC is also offering other ways to safely celebrate the holiday, including carving pumpkins and hosting virtual costume contests at home. Right now on the 11 Alive Facebook page, a lot of our viewers are sharing how they will spend Halloween and Thanksgiving. Let us know what your plans are and if anything has changed because of COVID-19. Still uh, seeing just mainly clouds out there right now. What you're seeing on radar, not all of that is making it to the ground. There might be just a few little raindrops here and there. This is the moisture well ahead of what we're watching with beta. It's a tropical depression that is inland right here on the uh, Texas coastline. You can kind of see the center of circulation right there isn't really moving that much. It made landfall right about here last night, and it's only moved up a little bit during the day today. At least it's over land though now and not over water. At some point we were thinking it might move back out over water, but it looks like it's going to stay right there along the coast as it moves up toward the north and also to the east. All right, take a look at this on the bigger picture. This is your emoji muggy cast. All right, this is the indicator of that moisture that is going to start coming back into our area. When you see the smiley faces, that's where we have dry weather. That's what we're dealing with right now with low dew points in our area. That's why we think that moisture that you are seeing on radar isn't making it to the ground because it's evaporating before it hits the ground. All right, so you see the smiley faces. This is tomorrow afternoon. We will have more more cloud cover tomorrow, but it's still going to be dry at the surface. We're not calling for any rain tomorrow, not going to be that muggy or anything. But look at this. Once we get into Thursday, that's when the moisture content starts moving back up and you see more humidity around and eventually some rain will start pushing in. We think later in the day on Thursday and then on Friday, we're going to have a good chance for rain too with the, that symbol right there showing the more humid weather that we'll be dealing with. And that goes into Saturday as well as we're still going to be kind of humid around and we'll still have just a few scattered showers in our area too. Stay with us. We're going to show you more about the track of what is left of beta and those remnants and how that's going to bring up more Gulf moisture to increase our rain chances. Vice President Mike Pence vowing today to quote fill that seat as the battle swirls on Capitol Hill over replacing late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Presidential candidate Joe Biden told reporters today he's punting on the hypothetical idea of expanding the court. If the vacancy is filled before November's election, the nation closely watching what happens next. In the middle of this debate, people have been questioning whether the Constitution actually allows for the number of justices to change. Evan Kozlov from our Verify team has the answer tonight. The Verify team is here for you throughout this upcoming Supreme Court nomination process. And obviously, we're hearing a lot right now from politicians. Here on the Verify team, we're just going to focus on the facts. If you look online, you're going to see a lot of posts like this, suggesting that if Democrats take back control of Congress in 2020, they could add seats to the Supreme Court. Some say two new justices, some say four, some are saying many more than that. So we're gonna verify, does the Constitution allow the number of Supreme Court justices to be changed? Here are sources, Article 3, Section 1 of the Constitution. This FAQ page from the Supreme Court website. Absolutely, no hesitation, clearly yes. And Adam Levitin from Georgetown Law. Let's start with the Constitution. It reads, the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court, and that the judges, quote, shall hold their offices during good behavior. But this section says nothing about the number of justices. Congress can change the number of justices on the court whenever it feels like. 
and historically it has. In fact, there were some big fluctuations in early American history. In 1789, the first Judiciary Act set the number of justices to six. During the Civil War, it got up to 10. In 1869, Congress settled it on nine justices. That's been the number we've had for the last 150 plus years, but there's nothing magic about it. It's just that's kind of where we, we set, the, set the number historically. And the last time that there was a push to change the number was in 1937 with President Franklin Roosevelt, but in the end, that effort failed. So we can verify that yes, Congress along with a signature from the president can change the number of justices, but this hasn't been done for more than 150 years. Can they? Absolutely. Will they? Less clear. All right, so you didn't order anything. So what's that Amazon package doing on your doorstep? Why it could be a scam next. Fear on 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Breaking news tonight, we are getting our first look at the moments leading up to a deadly police shooting in Southeast Atlanta last night. The police department just released the body cam video. We're going to show you a portion of it. A warning, it is disturbing. Put it down! You can hear officers telling Darian Bell several times to put the gun down. Police say Bell ignored their commands for 12 minutes. This all unfolded last night at Gladstone Apartments off Casanova Street. A woman told police she got into a fight with her husband. Officers noticed Bell had a gun once they got on the scene. An officer fired her gun when police say Bell moved towards them. He was rushed to the hospital but did not survive. 
A tense situation for more than six hours today with two neighborhoods in East Cobb County put on lockdown. Tracy Emig Pier tells us what happened. At around 5.30 this morning, neighbors here on Kingsley Drive started calling 911 after shots were fired inside and outside a nearby house. Police tell us some houses were even hit. Cobb County Police responded with SWAT teams and negotiators, locking down both the Newcastle and Arthur's Vineyard neighborhoods. This is East Cobb, nothing ever happens here. <laughs> you know, Leaving people like out. Philip no, Neal trying to figure out the safest place in his house to ride it out. It's a little scary. Um, you know, I lived here my whole life and there's never been any, at least major issues, you know, that I've ever known of. Sergeant Wayne Delk says the gunman was the only person in the house. A little after noon, after six hours of negotiations, the suspect was taken into custody. This ended the way we wanted it to. Uh, a peaceful resolution subject is in custody and we have no injuries to anyone. Delk tells us the gunman faces charges that range from discharging a firearm near a roadway to aggravated assault. Keeping an eye on radar tonight as we're seeing the clouds building in and even though you're seeing green here, uh, the, the air at the surface is so dry that even though there's moisture up in the upper levels, it's not really making it to the ground. Most of this is evaporating before it makes it to the ground. There could be one or two raindrops around, but uh, don't look for a lot of rain out there tonight. The main moisture is in association with what is left of beta. This is a tropical depression still. It was a tropical storm that moved inland there along the coast of Texas late last night, and now it's just moving very slowly up the coast. Inland, the center of the storm is inland, so that's a good thing, and that's why it has weakened just a little bit. It's no longer a tropical storm, but a tropical depression. Now let me show you as this moves slowly up toward the north and east what this is going to do for us as far as our moisture content in the air. This is our moisture map which shows those purples and blues indicating where we have dry air. We have that right now and we, it's been dry over the past few days. A lot of the moisture is uh, well out to the west and that's all in association with beta and you can see tomorrow that it's mainly going to be dry. Now in the upper levels we are going to see more moisture and that's going to be in the form of clouds and we'll see a better coverage of clouds around tomorrow than what we saw out there today. In fact, it's going to be mostly cloudy with just a little bit of sunshine breaking through here and there. Then you see more of this moisture building in on Thursday, and that's when we start to see the rain chances that are going to be coming up in our area on Thursday. Also into Friday, some showers, but it looks like most of that intense area of moisture is going to be down to the south of us. And then we start drying out again on Saturday. Now we're still going to hold on to a couple of rain chances on Saturday. The models are not totally coming together for the weekend. One model is showing dry air for Saturday and Sunday. The other one is showing rain for both days. I'm going with like a low rain chance. I'm really leaning toward the more drier scenario. So just know we're going to be working the next few days to pinpoint that for you. Here's a look at our dew points. Now we when we talk about the dew points, that's the measure of how much moisture is actually there in the atmosphere. We have the really dry air right now with those dew points that are in the 50s. And then we're going to see the dew points rising over the next few days as more of that moisture in association with the remnants of beta moves closer to us. And we'll also with that see our rain chances going up too. Today's high only 71. The average high for this time of year is 80. So we were nine degrees below average. It was also below average this morning too with a low of 51. We should be at about 63 for this time of year. We still have a big time surplus, but it's starting to shrink a little bit with the dry air but we can afford for that surplus to go down a little bit. We're a little bit more than 15 inches above where we should be in rainfall for the year. So check out the weather headlines. We're tracking those remnants of beta that'll be moving up toward the north and east, and that's going to give us a return to this tropical moisture with the rain chances coming up later Thursday into Friday, part, part, partly on Saturday as well. And temperatures are also going to warm up as we head into the weekend too. So here's your seven day outlook showing 76 for high. Wednesday, then 71 on Thursday, where we're going to see the rain chances coming up, especially later in the day. And then Friday, a, a good chance for some showers around, maybe a little thunder and lightning, but we don't expect anything severe. Lower rain chances Saturday into Sunday uh, with high temperatures back to the lower 80s. And we do think we'll be dry Monday and Tuesday with a high near 83 Monday, 82 on Tuesday. Have you received a package in the mail that's addressed to you, but you definitely don't remember ordering? More and more people say this is happening to them. And when one woman started asking questions, she uncovered a scam. Bianca Bueno with our sister station in Phoenix is looking at how it works. So the first time I got it, I opened it. I was like, I didn't order that. 
Hannah Muskolka of North Phoenix was sure it was a mistake. An Amazon package showing up to her door with her name and address, but she had never ordered it. I had to run to my Amazon account and have to like search through, like, did I order this? She didn't. Then the random packages kept coming from blackout curtains and ice trays to fake eyelashes and a nose hair trimmer. I've gotten um, batteries one time. I just got batteries randomly and I was like, thanks whoever you are because I could always use these. <laughs> While Hannah didn't mind the free merchandise, she wondered where these senders got her personal information. So she started digging. It's just really creepy. But we definitely class as, classify this as a scam. According to the Better Business Bureau, Hannah is not alone. In fact, she's one of many targets of a new scam called brushing. The main reason behind these scams are so that the third party retailers can create false verified reviews and the better reviews the better the sales that's false reporting to consumers Amazon well aware of the problem telling 12 news in a statement third-party sellers are prohibited from sending unsolicited packages to customers and we take action on those who violate our policies as for Hannah she says the packages haven't stopped making her a more skeptical shopper now suspicious of reviews Views that seem too good to be true. I've definitely double thought everything now on Amazon for sure. If this does happen to you, you should contact Amazon's customer service and change your account passwords. By the way, the Federal Trade Commission says you are legally allowed to keep whatever you get. Things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We don't think 
We're going to see the clouds increasing a little bit more during the day on Wednesday, but we're still holding off on any rain chances. The rain moves in later in the day on Thursday. That's going to linger into Friday and then tapering off as we head into the weekend. Now we've had some cool weather here the past few days. Tomorrow we're back up to 76, back down to 71 Thursday, and then warming for the end of the week and the weekend. In fact, weekend temperatures look like they'll be in the lower 80s, then about 82, 83 degrees for Monday and Tuesday with drier weather moving in for the beginning of next week. All right, stick around. Tune in to Up Late on 11 Alive at 11. The prime time rolls on right here at 10 with Jeff Hellinger. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Live news primetime on the ATL starts now. Tonight at 10, two women say they were held against their will and abused for weeks. How officers found them. President Trump planning a stop in Metro Atlanta this week. How supporters hope that he will use his visit to propel his campaign past Joe Biden. And vaping puts you at a higher risk for contracting COVID 19. First tonight, we begin with breaking news. Police body cam video has been released in an officer-involved shooting that left one man dead in southeast Atlanta last night. You can see the suspect, 28-year-old Darian Bell, walking toward an Atlanta police officer. He is armed with a handgun. Investigators say for 12 minutes he ignored officers' commands of a verbal nature to drop the gun. The GBI says... When Bell moved toward the officer, she shot him. Police say it began as a domestic dispute between Bell and his wife on 
Casanova Street near Gladstone Apartments. No officers were injured during this incident. Also new tonight, two women are safe after investigators say they were held against their will for weeks. Police say it all unfolded in a quiet Gwinnett County neighborhood. Natisha Lance is outside the Lilburn Police Department with details on this investigation. Natisha. Jeff, Lilburn police say that one woman escaped nearly two weeks ago, and that was how they were tipped off to this home. And today, the police department, along with several other agencies, executed that search warrant on the home. A swarm of police cars Tuesday afternoon at this home on Hood Road in Lilburn. Inside, Lilburn police, with help from Gwinnett County SWAT, served a search warrant on two men suspected of false imprisonment. Officers say they started working the case more than a week ago. That's when they say a 19-year-old woman made a desperate plea for help on September 11th after being held against her will for more than a month. It was a 911 call from the first woman on Friday evening, September the 11th, who had left the house unbeknownst to the men inside and was up the street at a neighbor's house. The neighbor called 911, setting the investigation in motion. We had spent all last week working the case, interviewing the victim, ensuring her safety. During the investigation, police realized there was another victim, a 40-year-old woman. It's not clear how the women got to the house or how they were being kept against their will. Investigators say a third woman was also found inside during the execution of the search warrant. It's unclear if she was being held captive. Police are also investigating possible sexual assault charges. And just before we went to air, investigators let me know that one of the men who was on the on that search warrant, Eric Johnson, has been arrested for a drug possession charge. The other man, Robert Everett, was released. However, police are saying that there could be more charges as they investigate further what was going on inside that house, Jeff. Natisha Lance outside the Lilburn Police Department in Gwinnett County. Thank you. Testing our wastewater for COVID-19. It is the latest recommendation from the White House Coronavirus Task Force report on Georgia. That's because the level of COVID in the city's wastewater can predict the levels of infection that will show up in a city a week or more later. John Shirek talked with the UGA researcher to explain all this. It turns out that UGA research is confirming what other states are finding, that COVID in a wastewater system can be an early warning for communities. In Athens, in June, when the bars reopened, UGA researchers decided to check the community's wastewater and found that the levels of COVID in the wastewater were increasing. Then later, sure enough, people started showing symptoms as individual testing measured higher numbers of infections. When Athens mandated masks for everyone, the UGA researchers detected lower levels of COVID in the community's wastewater, and those lower levels accurately predicted the decrease in infections that would follow. Dr. Aaron Lipp of UGA's College of Public Health Environmental Health Science Department is leading the research. And what we know about the virus so far is that it seems to be shed in feces early on in the infection. So often when people are asymptomatic, we see that the wastewater trends usually pick up the cases about seven days before we see them in the case reports. More and more states are testing community wastewater to get early warnings about potential COVID surges. At the University of Arizona, higher COVID levels showed up in a door dorms wastewater. So every student in the dorm got tested. Two of the students were positive and the university believes that that headed off a campus-wide outbreak. So it can give a local health department a heads up um, when it looks like there may be a cluster or an outbreak that might be coming. It may be a way to direct resources. Dr. Lip and her team at UGA are working with local health departments. The goal is to expand wastewater testing to more communities. More than 200,000 Americans have now died from COVID-19. The number of deaths roughly equal to the population of Augusta. Today, the milestone was marked with an interfaith memorial service on the National Mall. The nation's top corona expert, of course, is Dr. Anthony Fauci, calling the news stunning. The idea of 200,000 deaths is really very sobering and in some respects stunning. The universal wearing of masks, the attention to keeping distance, the avoiding of crowds, the trying to do things outdoors more than indoors, frequent washing of hands. We've said them so many times, but they're not universally implemented and employed. In Georgia, 6,677 people have now died with the virus. 73 of those deaths reported today, even though the average number of new cases has been dropping weekly, the death rate 
remains high. Hospitalization also remains steady, about 1,400 active patients each day, and it has not dipped below that number since early June. With testing down dramatically, another sign that only those who are seriously ill are taking time to find out if they do indeed have the virus. On Friday, President Trump planning an appearance in Atlanta. The details still in the works, but the campaign is hoping he will hold a rally that includes black voices for Trump, a group the president introduced in Atlanta last year. 11 Alive's Doug Richards has a look at why. In 2016, Donald Trump won Georgia with the thinnest Republican winning presidential margin in 20 years. In 2020, Republicans view Georgia as a state Trump cannot afford to lose. I really believe my father was, was put here for a reason. Last week, the president's son, Eric, spoke to a rally in Forsyth County. This week, his daughter Ivanka was in Atlanta with the attorney general. It's no surprise President Trump would also set his sights in Georgia, says State Senator Valencia C., who supports Democrat Joe Biden. They know that Georgia is turning blue, so they are coming here to try to make a difference. But we are lined up and we are ready to turn Georgia blue. He does not hate blacks. He does not hate illegals. Ten months ago, President Trump visited Georgia to launch a group called Black Voices for Trump, an effort to broaden Trump's appeal into a population of voters who have spent much of the last 50 years supporting Democrats. Since then, his campaign claims Trump volunteers and staff have knocked on a half million doors in Georgia and is running ads here showing African-American supporters of the president. I will vote for President Trump because he cares about people like me. A lot of us can agree, you know, hey, black lives matter, but we are seeing communities and businesses being destroyed. So I think people are saying, wait a minute. Angela Stanton King expects Trump's effort in Georgia to succeed and to help lift her candidacy. She's a Republican running for Congress to replace the late John Lewis. She faces Democrat Nakima Williams in a very Democratic district. And if we've been voting Democrat 140 years, why not give a Republican a shot? Georgia needs to be back in Democratic control. Senator C says that Biden will get a boost in Georgia this year because he chose Kamala Harris as his running mate. What Biden has not done is schedule a campaign event here. Delta Airlines is, is uh, pushing back on its date on its decision to furlough nearly 2,000 pilots. The new date is has been now slated for November 1st. It gives the airline more time to negotiate cost-cutting measures with the pilots union and to find out whether they will receive more federal coronavirus aid. Delta and the pilots union reached a tentative agreement last week to reduce furloughs by 220 pilots, with some pilots opting for early retirement packages. The suspect in a deadly hit and run in Marietta now is in jail, Martin Riviera was hit and killed earlier this month on I-75 while working on a construction project. And this is the man who has been arrested. He is a 20-year-old named Daniel Border. He is now facing a number of felony charges. A Miami man in custody tonight accused of opening fire outside of a strip club in Midtown. Michael Leslie is in the process of being extradited to Atlanta to face these charges. No one was hurt when the gunfire erupted outside of the Cheetah over Labor Day weekend, but several cars were damaged in the melee. Mainly dry weather out there right now, even though we're watching those clouds increasing, the moisture is still well out to the west, and that's what it's moving around and circulating around Beta, which is now a tropical depression. The system's moving northeast. I'll let you know what that means for our rain chances here. We're breaking down the de-escalation steps officers should take during a violent situation. That is coming up next. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. 
We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Tonight we are digging further into police, the police shooting in Oconee County where a woman was killed yesterday. The police body camera video was released. Here is some background. The Sheriff's Department says that Julia Ann Moss appeared to be in a manic state after stabbing a dog and hitting a man with a metal pipe. The department says deputies tried to de-escalate the situation, but then Moss came at them with a knife, leading a deputy to shoot her. Ron Jones has more. After spending eight and a half years as a police officer and sergeant in California, I was always taught when you enter a situation like this, you have to think about the safety of the residents inside, the person you are engaging, and also the officer's safety as well. But your priority is to de-escalate this situation. According to the National Institute of Justice, officers hope these four techniques can help resolve the confrontation. First of all, an officer's presence. No force necessary, and it's considered the best way to resolve a confrontation. Verbal commands, calm and direct, where no physical force is used. Hands-on, where you use physical force to get the person to comply, and less than lethal, such as a taser, mace, or baton. The fifth option in this case, of course, was deadly force. So now GBI has to determine if it was the appropriate use of force to resolve the situation. You can see for yourself, we posted the footage as well as all of the details about this case on both 11alive.com and the 11 Alive app. Here's some more perspective. So far this year, the GBI has been called to investigate 73 cases. 34 people were killed in addition to a canine officer. Quiet weather now, but we could see rain later this week. Our chief meteorologist, Chris Holcomb, joins us with a forecast. A taste of fall is so sweet indeed, much like pumpkin spice. Yeah, and fall officially arrived this morning, and it felt kind of like fall today with high temperatures up to 71 degrees, about 9 degrees below average. We should be around 80 for this time of year. It was a great early part of the day with cool air, a lot of sunshine, but during the day we started seeing some of those high thin clouds building in. Now they're thickening up a little bit, not producing any rain. Earlier, radar was showing some green, that some moisture uh, particles in the upper atmosphere, but it was all diminishing before it was making it to to the ground and the radar is kind of clean that up right now showing it not making it to the ground and this is the main moisture in association with beta was a tropical storm moved inland last night on the coast of texas and now you see the center of circulation over land it's a tropical depression now moving still up toward the north and to the east and eventually that's going to spread more rain into our direction let me show you what we're watching uh, as we go through the rest of the evening hours tonight our future radar showing mainly just those clouds around as we go through the early morning hours tomorrow morning uh, and then uh, you know those clouds breaking up a little bit to give us some sunshine mid morning and into the early afternoon. So on the wisometer for tomorrow, we're just going to go with a nine. Now that's not bad. Still a pretty good day, but it's not quite a 10 or 11 and 11 is the uh, perfect day an 11 live day. We're going to see more clouds, not as much sunshine, a low of 57 and a high of 76 degrees in the afternoon. So those afternoon temperatures are starting to come up just a little bit more. Here's a look at the forecast track. You see the clouds that are over us right now. Those are going to stick with us tonight. Now tomorrow they may thin out a little bit and just kind of allow some filtered sunshine at times. Same thing in the afternoon, some breaks here and there to give us some sun. And we're not really worried about a rain chance here for tomorrow. It's going to be on Thursday when we see more of that moisture out to the west that starts pushing our way, but still on Thursday, not a washout. Really, the rain chances will be higher later in the day. I think the first part of the day on Thursday will be mainly dry, still with that mixture of sunshine and clouds. A few showers up in North Georgia, and then we're watching out to the west as this moisture starts spilling in and Cleburne, Randolph County into Alabama, seeing some of those showers moving in late afternoon, also in parts.
parts of northwest Georgia. And then that keeps pushing in uh, through the evening hours, even some pockets of moderate to heavy rain in northwest Georgia later on Thursday. And then more of that will come in on Friday as well. And this is all related to what's happening with the moisture building in along with the remnants of, well, this is going to be a tropical depression here still on Wednesday afternoon. And there you see the remnants moving up into north Alabama and Tennessee by Friday. So all this moisture is still feeding in from the Gulf of Mexico, uh, increasing our rain chances. Now the rain totals are going to be higher along where you saw the track of that center of that area of low pressure. That's where you see those higher rainfall amounts at three and four inches. But for us, we're going to see the light green colors showing about a half inch to an inch, maybe some spots around two inches. I think the higher amounts of heavier rain will be to the north of us in North Georgia with maybe those one and two inch totals. Um, but we're going to have lower amounts here. Now another system that we're watching, this is Teddy. It is no longer uh, considered a hurricane, even though winds are at 75 five miles an hour. It's lost some of its tropical characteristics, but it still has strong winds with it, bringing in some major waves in Nova Scotia, even parts of the northeastern coast getting some rough surf there too, continuing to move northward and falling apart. And then of course there's Paulette. We told you about Paulette last night that it died out, then regenerated. It's now back to a tropical storm. Looks like it'll die out again and just kind of loop around out there in the far eastern Atlantic. Still don't think it's going to have any impact on us, but it's interesting to watch that. 76 degrees for a high tomorrow. Clouds increasing and then the rain comes in later Thursday into Friday. Folks, I want to tell you for the weekend, we're getting some conflicting model messages here. Uh, one model is showing the rain chances much lower on Saturday and Sunday. We're going to keep in a low risk right now. I'm going to be feeling a little more confident tomorrow into the next day whether we can take these rain chances out. We do have no rain chances Monday and Tuesday as these temperatures climb back up into the lower 80s. Take a look at your weather wow moment. This is from Scott Anna up in the Blairsville area. Uh, he always takes great pictures for us. This is a nice view up in the mountains of North Georgia. Nice green foliage there that's going to start changing colors very soon and a nice view of the mountains and the blue sky too. Scott's one of our 11 Alive community storm trackers. You can be one too on Facebook just search 11 Alive Storm Trackers. You can ask to become a member of this closed group and then you can see the pictures, videos and weather information that other people are sharing and you can share your info there too. All right, Chris, thank you very much. We appreciate it. We'll have more with Chris coming up in a few minutes. A special friendship between a 94 year old man and a group of local school bus drivers is making the COVID quarantine a little less lonely. 94 year old Oli Doty walks five miles a day around his assisted living and memory care facility in Woodstock. It was on those walks that he started waving at the local bus drivers. The drivers came to expect to see Oli and then look forward to it. They called the memory care facility to find out more about him. The group started sending him cards and letters to thank him for the joy that he brought each and every day. The friendship blossomed to the point where the drivers set up a safe, socially distanced meetup wearing Falcons gear there we see. His daughter said it meant the world to see some folks like that. He's always been a people person, so now he has a connection with the community, even though he's under quarantine. I love him. <laughs> Drivers all got to meet Oli, introduced him to some of the kids who drive by him on the bus every day, and they served him his favorite root beer floats. I'm in. I like that one, too. That's old school dessert. We don't see those much anymore. I'll share that with you, Oli. After the break, experts break down why people who vape and smoke are at a higher risk for contracting COVID-19. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. 
Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Health experts continue to sound the alarm about smoking and vaping at any time, but particularly during the pandemic. They believe smoking and vaping can increase a person's chances of contracting COVID-19 and it can lead to more serious outcomes. They're narrowing in on the possible reasons why. Here's NBC's Sarah Dolliff. New links between smoking, vaping, and COVID-19. Researchers looking at proteins called ACE2 receptors that may serve as entry points for coronavirus. Smokers often have more than non-smokers. Clearly patients with lung disease, smokers do worse. And the connection is that ACE2 receptors. Cedar sinai Dr. Zab Mozenafar says smokers who do contract the virus tend to get sicker and may have an increased chance of being hospitalized or placed on a ventilator. Stop smoking, help us, help you. It's a plea amplified by health experts nationwide who say no age group is safe. A Stanford University School of Medicine study found young people who vape were more likely to contract coronavirus than non-users. If you have ever used an electronic cigarette, you are five times more likely to be diagnosed with COVID-19. The American Lung Association launching a new campaign. You would never try it. Encouraging parents to talk to their kids about the dangers of vaping. Conversations that are especially important right now, as pediatric pulmonologist Dr. Christy Sadramelli. Doing something that could hurt your lungs right now in the time of a respiratory disease pandemic is just not a great idea. The pandemic providing more reasons to extinguish those lights for good. All right, coming up next, COVID-19 deaths. What the numbers really reveal. We'll have a look at that as we continue our coverage on the pandemic. Here on 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Prime Time, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, The worst possible outcome for contracting COVID-19 is death, obviously, but there has been some debate on whether the numbers are really telling all of the story. Would those people have died anyway? Here's Reveal investigator Rebecca Lindstrom to explain why she no longer wrestles with that question. He had a huge heart. When I asked Felicia Selkirk to gather some pictures of her dad, she paused. You know, it's, it's definitely a a sore spot. There have been moments and days where it was hard for me because I have so many pictures of him in my phone where I didn't want to even open my phone. Pictures of her dad's time in the Army, his master's in theology at Harvard, or his yearly stint as Santa at a homeless shelter for women and children. And for the longest time, I did not realize that he was my Santa. <laughs> family photos marking moves from Boston to California and a love that lasted 45 years. But in March at age 67, Frank Selkirk was dead. What would you say killed your father? I would definitely say COVID killed my father. COVID is listed on his death certificate. So is pneumonia. Frank also had high blood pressure and an irregular heartbeat. In the COVID data, he is one of those listed with underlying health conditions. But Felicia says people need to understand none of that caused his death. I need people to know that this is real. This life taken is real. This hurt is real. This pain is real. His absence is real. The CDC analyzes deaths from the past three years to figure out how many people are likely to die now. Right around COVID, you can see that number slowly starting to tick up, peaking the week of April 11th, when 42% more people died than expected. 21% of those deaths were associated with COVID. Dr. Amber Schmidtke says it's just one reason she pushes back against the notion that these people would have died anyway. I think that this is misinformation. Dr. Schmidtke points to this chart to show us what's happening. You see, there was an abnormal spike at the beginning of 2018. It was a really bad flu season. And 2020 is the only other time we see a spike over the past five years. And that's a big one. It's really pretty easy to see the stark difference in how many deaths we're experiencing this year compared to past years. And that's honestly the way that I like to look at what is the true impact of COVID-19. If you break it down by race, you can see for deaths not related to COVID, black people had a few bumps in the trend, but factor in COVID and the line jumps. The same for white people. Happy birthday to you. 
Frank and his granddaughter share birthdays three days apart, so each year they'd pick a day in the middle to celebrate. This was their last one together. He's always in our heart. Felicia thought her father was getting better when she received a call. She had two minutes to say goodbye. The nurse told me that I only had two minutes because she was very hot and that that's about as much time that she could give me in his room. We said a prayer together and he said, tell everyone I love them. And those were his last words. <laughs> he was just a very awesome person. Some of the people who died this year didn't have COVID, but it was still a factor. A spike in dementia-related deaths is blamed on isolation after nursing homes went on lockdown. And delays in routine medical care have also had an impact. A second federal judge in New York has ordered the U.S. Postal Service to process election mail in a timely manner. The ruling came after several people sued, saying President Trump. The USPS and its new boss were endangering election mail. In a statement, the Postal Service said its number one priority was to deliver election mail on time. The Republican National Committee and the Georgia Republican Party are urging federal, a federal judge to overturn a ruling allowing absentee ballots received after Election Day to be counted. Joe Hankey tracking the story for us. In late August, a federal judge ruled absentee ballots in Georgia should be accepted up to three days past the November election date, as long as the absentee ballots are postmarked by Election Day. Now the state and federal Republican parties are asking for that ruling to be overturned. The ruling came from U.S. District Judge Eleanor Ross in response to a lawsuit from the voter registration organization New Georgia Project. State law previously required all absentee ballots to be received by county election officials by 7 p.m. on Election Day. The ruling was based on increased absentee ballot requests during the COVID-19 pandemic. Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger quickly appealed the ruling to the 11th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. In this 32-page brief filed today in federal court, the Republican National Committee and Georgia Republican Party are supporting Raffensperger's appeal. The brief argues Georgia voters have more than ample opportunity to vote. They have an expansive time frame to vote absentee. It mentions ballot requests can be made up to 180 days before the election. Absentee ballots can be received up to 40 nine days before the election and returned by mail, drop box, hand delivered or even canceled if a voter later decides to vote in person. Georgia Republican Party Chairman David Schaefer wrote in a statement, Democrats have filed a barrage of frivolous lawsuits seeking to eliminate election safeguards, sow confusion and upend the timely and accurate counting of votes. New Georgia Project lawsuit only named 17 of the state's 159 counties, including the state's most populous counties such as Fulton, DeKalb, Cobb and Gwinnett. The Republican brief filed today claims the plaintiffs picked counties with traditionally higher support for Democratic candidates. And if the ruling stands, the extended window for accepting absentee ballots would only apply to those 17 counties, while voters elsewhere would be handled differently. At 11 Alive here, we want to make sure that your vote is secure. For a full list of resources and key dates ahead of the November election, head over to 11alive.com. Slash vote. President Trump in a pre-recorded speech to the United Nations calling for China to be held responsible for the spread of COVID-19. He accused the country and the WHO, the World Health Organization, of misleading the world. The Chinese government and the World Health Organization, which is virtually controlled by China, falsely declared that there was no evidence of human-to-human -human transmission. They falsely said people without symptoms would not spread the disease. The United Nations must hold China accountable for their actions. China's U.N. ambassador later calling the accusations baseless. China's president said the issue shouldn't be politicized and there should be a joint international response to defeat the pandemic. About 80 percent of people say they can't imagine Halloween without trick-or-treating, according to the National Confectioner Association. That's a sweet group. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is saying that parents and children might have to start. 11 Alive's Brittany Kleinpeter has more details. Hey, happy Halloween. Here happy we go. Halloween. I'm basically going to miss all the costumes. I'm going to miss um, that uh, sometimes I can take my mask off. So, like taking our friends with us to trick or treat. The Slaughter family plans on trick or treating this year, but it's going to look a lot different. On Tuesday, the CDC released new Halloween guidelines due to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
The Federal Health Agency advises against door-to-door -door trick or treating. The CDC says it's too risky and you should also avoid hay rides and tractor rides with others. But there are safer alternatives for you and your family. Try one-way direction paths for trick-or-treating where you can socially distance or set out pre-bagged candy bags at the edge of your yard or driveway. You don't have to ghost Halloween altogether. There's still ways to celebrate while minimizing the risk for COVID-19. You know, everything has been really upended this year and everyone's looking for a little bit of joy in their life. And Halloween is one of those moments that everyone can come together and celebrate in their own way. Despite the CDC's warnings, the debate over whether to trick or treat is definitely still mixed. One person on Facebook writing, incredible, the amount of people willing to risk lives, especially children's lives, all for candy. Another person writing, the CDC is trying to control us all. The CDC is also offering other ways to safely celebrate the holiday, including carving pumpkins and hosting virtual costume contests at home. Have you received a package in the mail that's addressed to you, but you definitely don't remember ordering it? More and more people say it's happening to them. And when one woman started asking questions, she figured out a scam. Here's Bianca Biono with our sister station in Phoenix looking at how it works. So the first time I got it, I opened it. I was like, I didn't order that. Hannah Muskoka of North Phoenix was sure it was a mistake. An Amazon package showing up to her door with her name and address, but she had never ordered it. I had to run to my Amazon account and have to like search through, like, did I order this? She didn't. Then the random packages kept coming from blackout curtains and ice trays to fake eyelashes and a nose hair trimmer. I've gotten um, batteries one time. I just got batteries randomly and I was like, thanks whoever you are, because I could always use these. <laughs> While Hannah didn't mind the free merchandise, she wondered where these senders got her personal information. So she started digging. It's just really creepy. But we definitely class classify this as a scam. According to the Better Business Bureau, Hannah is not alone. In fact, she's one of many targets of a new scam called brushing. The main reason behind these scams are so that the third party retailers can create false verified reviews. And the better reviews, the better the sales. That's false reporting to consumers. Amazon well aware of the problem, telling 12 News in a statement, third party sellers are prohibited from sending unsolicited packages to customers. And we take action on those who violate our policies. As for Hannah, she says the packages haven't stopped, making her a more skeptical shopper, now suspicious of reviews that seem too good to be true. I've definitely double thought everything now on Amazon, for sure. And this experience certainly is one that Amazon is taking a look at as they continue to assess exactly where the scam may be going and how their customers can best be warned. Law enforcement also is looking at it to try and determine as to where it will be going from here. Coming up next, the battle on Capitol Hill over filling the seat on the country's highest court. We're verifying whether the Constitution allows for Congress to change the number of justices depending on how it all plays out. And we are watching the remnants of Beta spreading a lot of rain in on the Texas and Louisiana coastline. As it moves northeast, it's going to start spreading some of that moisture our way. I'll let you know if that's going to linger into the weekend. Braves set some Major League Baseball history. It's a new world. Well, it's an old world really for the Braves, but it's a new world to celebrate. Very low key. We'll talk about that coming up. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. 
Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Vice President Mike Pence vowing today to fill that seat as the battle swirls on Capitol Hill over replacing the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Joe Biden told reporters today he is punting on the hypothetical idea of expanding the court if the vacancy is filled before November's election. The nation closely watching what happens next. In the middle of this debate, people have been questioning whether the Constitution actually allows for the number of justices to change Evan Kozlov from our Verify team has the answer. The Verify team is here for you throughout this upcoming Supreme Court nomination process. And obviously, we're hearing a lot right now from politicians. If you're on the Verify team, we're just going to focus on the facts. If you look online, you're going to see a lot of posts like this, suggesting that if Democrats take back control of Congress in 2020, they could add seats to the Supreme Court. Some say two new justices, some say four, some are saying many more than that. So we're gonna verify, does the Constitution allow the number of Supreme Court justices to be changed? Here are sources, Article 3, Section 1 of the Constitution. This FAQ page from the Supreme Court website. Absolutely, no hesitation, clearly yes. And Adam Levitin from Georgetown Law. Let's start with the Constitution. It reads, the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court, and that the judges, quote, shall hold their offices during good behavior. But this section says nothing about the number of justices. Congress can change the number of justices on the court whenever it feels like. And historically, it has. In fact, there were some big fluctuations in early American history. In 1789, the first Judiciary Act set the number of justices to six. During the Civil War, it got up to 10. In 1869, Congress settled it on nine justices. That's been the number we've had for the last 150 plus years. But there's nothing magic about it. It's just that's kind of where we, we set, the, set the number historically. And the last time that there was a push to change the number was in 1937 with President Franklin Roosevelt. But in the end, that effort failed. So we can verify that, yes, Congress, along with a signature from the president, can change the number of justices. But this hasn't been done for more than 150 years. Can they? Absolutely. Will they? Less clear. 
since the start of COVID-19, the outdoors have become an escape for many looking for a, a, a reboot from a day of remote working and virtual learning. Now one local woman is using the backdrop of a West Side Trail to boost others with positivity. Here's Liza Lucas. The next time you're on the Proctor Creek Greenway, take a pause. You might encounter a surprise, a sign, a message your soul needed to hear. Such inspiration found sprinkled along this popular path. Anastasia Fussell and friends taking extra paint and extra time at home to reach others. For me, this project started out years ago. So I always thought it'd be really cool to do some public art. And, you know, now with COVID and kind of everything that happened, it seemed like a really good time to have some positive messages to, to put out there to cheer people up. Her creations tucked into trees, messages blending into the background. I think a lot of people are kind of reconnecting with nature nowadays. It was a good place to reach them with these little messages of positivity and really hoping to bring smiles to someone's face. And while some of the art may wander off, this artist doesn't mind. I'm glad that people are taking them because I'm hoping that, you know, they're taking it home and it brings some joy there as well. So on the days when life is getting you down, look up. You may see what you need to keep going. Well, we have dry weather in our area right now. We really enjoyed a nice dry feel to the air with not a lot of humidity around. And you can see this evidence here by the blues and purples over North Georgia. That's indicating that drier air where we run into more moisture and wet weather. That's when you move closer to the Gulf Coast region, closer to what we're dealing with, with the remnants of beta. And that's the oranges and reds and yellows that you see. So watch as we go through the day tomorrow. A little more moisture is going to start moving our way, but that's mainly going going to be in the form of additional clouds. We're not expecting any rain here, but dew points starting to rise. It's going to start feeling a little more humid. And then on Thursday, especially later in the day, more of that moisture starts feeding in and we will see our rain chances going up Thursday into early on Friday. And then latest model data is indicating more dry air comes in later on uh, Friday and then into Saturday and on Sunday. Now the models aren't in total agreement as to what's going to happen for the weekend. I'm still keeping in a low rain chance, but I'm liking seeing the trends going into the weekend of this drier air actually being able to overtake the moisture that we're going to have at the surface. So we may be bringing those rain chances down over the next couple of days here for the weekend. Uh, into Monday, we're looking pretty good too with dry weather as well. Here's a look at the dew points. This is the actual measure of moisture in the atmosphere. Uh, we're very dry right now and comfortable dew points, but then they're going to start rising, especially Thursday into Friday back into the 60s. Not that oppressive dew point, but you know, more humid air around and then we'll see those rain chances that'll be up a little bit. Now, I'm not really concerned about severe weather. Even with a landfalling tropical system, yeah, they're having a lot of rain. They're having some flooding in parts of Texas and into Louisiana, but not really any tornadoes or anything. And often that happens with a landfalling tropical system, but that's not what's happening with this one. Just general showers, we think, over a big part of the Gulf Coast region for tonight and then also into tomorrow. And then as we go into Thursday, we're going to see that general shower risk come into our area. But, you know, it, there might be a rumble of thunder, a flash of lightning, but we don't really expect anything severe out of this as that tropical moisture moves our way. So we're going to be tracking the remnants of beta as it moves to the north and east closer to us, and that's going to increase that tropical moisture moving in, which will also increase our rain chances. And with that more southerly flow coming in from the south and west, transporting that moisture our way, it's also going to help to warm things up a little bit. We're going to get back up into the uh, uh, lower 80s. But for now, it's another cool start or cool night out there. We're really not going to see a freeze, you know, any like really colder air like we had the past couple of mornings, but still in the 50s, but it's going to be the upper 50s, and those clouds are helping to keep things a little milder. We get up to 76 in the afternoon with mostly cloudy skies. Rain chance later on Thursday into Friday. Still for the weekend, we're going to bring those rain chances down a little bit uh, with high temperatures in the 80s, and we look dry Monday and Tuesday. So here we go. The Braves chasing history tonight, trying for their 20th division title in team history, which would be a Major League Baseball record. A win tonight against the Marlins gives them the National League East. And they waste no time. Bottom of the first inning, Marcel Ozuna unloads deep and gone. one nothing Braves. Next inning, Ozzie Albies. And the Braves are happy as bad as back in the lineup. Man, this team has so much offense. 
Hey, do he gives that one a ride. It's 2 nothing. Braves hit five home runs tonight, including one from Freddie Freeman, who may win the batting title this year, maybe the MVP as well. The lineup's so very dangerous. Up 11-1 in the ninth, last out. There it's it. There it is. The Braves win the National League East for the third straight year. The celebration is different. No fans in truest. So strange, but still not strange in this sense. The Braves always find a way to win a division title, don't, let, don't they? They're going back to the playoffs. You're the National League East champions. I mean, that's a big deal. And, and um, you have to do that in order to get your, give yourself a chance to do something else. So, um, like I say, I'm very proud of the club, the coaches, the strength staff, the trainers, every, uh, you know, everybody involved. Congrats to those guys. Time to start winning some world titles, though. The time is here. That's how they can forge their own identity from Smoltz, Glavin, and Maddox. Win some world titles. Georgia Tech returns to ACC play with a trip to Syracuse on Saturday. Jeff Collins building a program. We've seen some ups and downs already in two games, but Tech can claim back-to-back -back ACC Rookies of the Week. Part of what Jeff Collins says is recruiting and culture, and it's not just the players that are here now. The guys that play here right now, whether they were recruited since we've been here, whether they were recruited and were on the team before, whether they played before we got here, <laughs> those are Georgia Tech football players. And the prototypes might change, the eras might change, the style of offenses and defenses might change, but the guys that have lined up and played in the white and gold matter and are valued around here. We call them legends of the flats. So if they've played the last five years, the last 10 years, the last 20 years, however far you want to go back, they matter to the culture. They matter to what we're building. They matter to the legacy. How about those T-shirts Collins wears? How about that one? What was that, juice and a crown of some kind? <laughs> I like it. One ACC game is off the schedule. Saturday's Notre Dame Wake Forest game is off after a spike. Positive COVID-19 tests among the Irish football players. According to the university, 13 Notre Dame players are in isolation. Tanner in quarantine. The game could be made up no, next month. Let's hope so. Yep. All right, side. that's sports. We'll take a break. We're back right after this. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. 
because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Clouds will be on the increase during the day on Wednesday. Uh, you know, those clouds will be thickening up a little bit more. We'll still see some sunshine that'll be able to shine through at times. Temperatures a little warmer, up to 76 degrees. And then the rain chances coming up later in the day on Thursday into Friday. Uh, rain chances coming back down Saturday and Sunday. We're looking dry Monday and Tuesday with temperatures warming back up into the lower 80s. Doing their part to make a difference. We see you. We hear you and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you